Yeah, it's a protective measure because of Marcelo, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody who's next to my frame needs to wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> We have somebody here in our district who is making, who is producing self-made um, masks. Yeah, it's kind of easy, no? Yeah, it's very easy. I saw an, uh, I saw an explication today, which doesn't need to, we don't have to... Nin, what is the name of Nin? Sue. Sue, Sue. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I always think like that Zoom is a bit limiting, no? Like uh, I would love it uh, that that each people person could have like kind of a profile also with with maybe like like a sentence about themselves. To, 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 to get everybody to find out what they're doing. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Yeah, but if you, if, you, if, you, if you start to make it more profile to the, to, the, to the thing, like it starts being another kind of Instagram with live session. So it's just more information under, for more information, for more information. Yeah, but that's what I like. It would be another level. Yeah, could be. Well, well. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> could be. That's, that's your, like your answer. Every time when I'm telling shit, you're always like, yeah, could be. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like that. I don't, it's better to say it could be than say no. No, man, that's not happening. That's very motivating always. <laughs> no, I always say could be to motherfucking yes. Amazing yeah. idea. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? Hi, Maya. Hi, Tur. Hi, Dan. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. I've invited to the conversation. That's really cool, yeah. Nice. We're in the park. Thank you. Nice <laughs> park. Lovely to join you. I'm Fran and Joel here. Hi, Fran and Joel. Hey. Hold up, mate. How are you, yeah. Shay? I think we wait for like, I don't think we wait for five minutes. Or... No, I'm good. Yeah, good. I think we wait for five minutes and then we start. Okay, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, it's getting mad. It's getting full. <laughs> have you, have you, Lucas, have you opened with the full version? Um, yeah. Cool. How does the park look like? Is there a Give lot of people? Yeah. We show you the park. Yeah. Yes. Show us the park. <laughs> Here's the oh. sunset. Wow. Sunset of London. Nice. Oh. Oh, Sunset nice. of London. Hey, Armin. Hello. You're all right. Yeah, good. Thanks. How are you doing? Armin. Hi, Armin. Hello. Hi, Armin. Hey, Turo. What's up, yo? Yo, man. Long time, man. How are you? Hey, Maya. Hey. Hmm. hey. Hi, Andreas. Hello. Hi. Yeah, maybe maybe for the hello to everyone, for the persons who are new, we have a just a ten minute period of like uh, introduction. Well, not introduction of like waiting for everyone to connect in case they are a bit late or something. Mm. So for now, we just uh, wait five more minutes and then. Uh, Another uh, friend of mine will uh, announce kind of like the the 
the lineup for the for the, for the talk. So just be a bit patient. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Hey Alex. Hey. Alex. Hi Alex. <laughs> I just think you know it's crazy. Like, if you are, mm -hmm. I just think you know, you're the best little set in the planet. Mm -hmm. When you're off my time, when you get it, like, there's a like, mm -hmm. like <laughs> who is who is putting these birds out? Yeah, I really like the bird ah. effect here. Well, who's who's giving up the bird? I think I think it's Zamanak. Like, I think it's the guy from the guys from the park, no? <laughs> no, they, they have the audio off. Yeah, it's oh? weird because there's actually actually they have the audio out. out. Uh, it's me. I'm Fran. Hi, everyone. Ah, okay, it's Hi. Fran. Okay, Fran has no audio. So, sorry, no no video. So yeah, there's, there's, there's a black a there's a black bird above my head, but I've got no video today. So no, he's cool. Leave him, leave him. It could be fake. It could be fake. You know, maybe she's just fake in the background. I think this is like the record for participants. No. Yeah. And we have two Twitch watchers. <laughs> Crazy. Do we need to wait for the other person who's presenting as well? Um, she should join us soon. She wrote me a message um, asking for the link, so I send. It. I'm sending it to her. Um, <coughs> but I think Sechi, you're going to start presenting anyways because I think it's the okay. Best. Cool. A lot, so um, yeah. I think maybe I start just by introducing what the digital temple is about and about our program today. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Mm. Okay. Okay, um, welcome to you all to the fourth edition of the Digital Temple. Um, we are Loom, we are an open collective from Hamburg um, with like different members like from, from coming from architects over artists, um, graphic designers, um, urban designers um, and we all come together usually to um, yeah work on installations in, in public space um, and um, creating spaces of encounter. And um, with this new situation that we are facing, um, we couldn't do our gatherings anymore um, at our usual spaces. So we thought about creating this um, digital temple and to invite friends um, for discussions and for presenting yeah certain projects or topics that are close to them so in the first edition we had panosmico from mexico city um presenting a project about um, one of the last remaining rivers that is flowing above the surface in mexico city then we had a friend from amsterdam speaking about public space um and um what is changing now in in our in our relationship to public space and with covid 19 and we also had an artist a studio with it in, in cyprus and um yeah we had um some presentations um regarding the relationship of COVID 19 and purity and usually we just start um our settings by this short introduction and then we go, go over to the presentations 
And after each presentation, we just have a short round of questions or thoughts, but not too long, like maybe just like three or five minutes, because we like to um, have this flow of presentations so that after we, we had the presentations, we can start um, an open discussion and everybody can share their thoughts and we have this room for also a lot of cross references. All right, so um, I will stop sharing my screen now and we'll hand over to Zichi. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. Let me just go to the door. Okay, so my presentation is talking about my work, but also in the context of architecture to promote circular design using recycled materials, um, which is um, the main project that I'm going to talk about is related to that. Um, and the first thing I want to start off with is this film called Koyanis Koyas Katz which I heard about um, at a lecture that the Architecture Foundation that is based in the UK um, about climate emergency was talking about last week um, and I found it really interesting that the last um, it, it has different meanings in Hopi language and the last one it says a state of life that calls for another way of living and I thought it was really relevant to obviously now in terms of the pandemic and coronavirus but also in terms of climate emergency and how we need to change our ways of life and how we kind of our relationship with the environment as well. Um, so climate change is not just a pol pollution issue, it is an indicator of how human society and culture have become divorced from our natural habitat. habitat. Um, and I think it's important to remember that we're obviously in an ecosystem and that we are part of that ecosystem. So to remember that what we produce and what we create, um, therefore, is a cycle and carries on and influences the rest of the world. Um, so keeping that in mind, as from, at least from my background as in, in architecture, what things do we put out into the world? What, how does it affect the environment and also us? Um, so then also looking at anthropocene, which is basically the kind of the age that we're living in now, where human activity has created um, an illogical, um, geological effect on the planet, which is pretty drastic compared to um, any other um, um, geological era, which lasts for about like 10,000 of years, um, which has taken place in only 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. So, and obviously the building, um, the built environment plays a very big part of um, greenhouse emissions and the carbon footprint on the earth. So thinking about that in relationship to kind of our human impacts and how kind of we've kind of really radically changed the landscape and therefore our ecosystem and therefore us. And it comes always back to us at the end of the day. Um, and then I also really like, it's a bit of a blood picture, but I saw this the other day, um, someone posted it. And it says the romanticization of the quarantine is a class privilege. Um, and I wanted to just talk about this in terms of that currently the purpose of architecture has morphed into like the appreciation of assets or finance and wealth and like money driven um, and that shapes the physical environment and the cost of this approach to those not inside the kind of circle of investment and reaping the rewards um, in return it ero is an erosion of community and increases the living costs and the degradation of the environment so just thinking about what we value at the moment and what we hold value in the built environment and how that affects um, both our communities, our well-being, and also um, our connection to each other in society and our, live, our livelihoods, for example, our living standards as well. Um, and I also um, like this quote that I found somewhere um, from a talk, um, which is looking about how we kind of respond to the climate emergency through a way of compassion and love and also through creativity so as we play our part in communities and work and workplaces to meet these times well it's important to pause play and call upon creative spirit um, and i think it's important to remind ourselves that it's from these times that creativity flourishes the most and that is what will drive us through into the future and change systems and how we live 
um, in the world. And I also wanted to look at the fact that the UK, as well as not just the UK, but lots of um, architects have declared a climate and um, biodiversity emergency, um, which is um, globally, which is great because it means that um, there's a global movement to figure out what can be done in terms of action to take um, in the built environment. So meeting the needs of all within, all within the needs of the planet, which is by Cape um, Rothworth, is a really good, great quote in terms of thinking about our needs in the planet and always putting the planet first and kind of re-changing the hierarchy of the human importance over environmental importance and seeing that it's interconnected. Um, so I'm starting off with um, this photo, which is um, Long Way Home. Um, and the project that I'm going to talk about kind of stems from this because I did an in sustainable internship in 2017, I think, um, about three months there when I was in Guatemala. And this is a, um, it's, so the organization is called No Way Home, but the school is actually called Los Tecnicos Chicot, which is based just off this main road in Guatemala, which has a lot of um, car and car traffic and also um, a lot of, I think, mechanical repairs. So it's basically built mainly from tires, retaining walls um, with rammed earth in it and kind of using the base of the earth ship, um, which is basically um, the idea of sun heating up um, a space that is predominantly um, half set into the, uh, half set into the earth and then allowing it to release during the night. Um, so whilst I was there, I kind of learned different building techniques, um, but also was inspired by how the school and the organization worked. Um, and they kind of use sustainable design and materials to promote education, employment and env environmental stewardship. So all the people obviously who work there are local, but they obviously have a big volunteer scheme, but also the um, kids who um, as the school was being built, also learn to, about sustainable building techniques and also do um, real life projects in the community and create um, sustainable projects. And also it was really interesting how um, before the school was developed, which has been going on for years now, the idea of there was a big, there's still a big um, uh, problem with waste management in this area of Guatemala. Um, and a lot of it's been dumped in the valley and there's still an understanding of um, inorganic waste. Um, so a lot of the kids, for example, bring in recycled materials into a big um, bank and that subsidizes, for example, their school fees and so forth. Um, so this was the school um, as it was being built. And this, I think about three of the classrooms with a big cistern at the, um, which goes really, really deep into the ground where they collect all their rainwater during the rainy season, um, which allows for building um, and construction and so forth. Um, and these small pictures of the children and also had them learning about the environments that they're living in whilst it's being built. Um, and then these photos kind of show where my inspiration for the project that I'm going to talk to you about comes from. Um, look at these kind of glass bottles that are embedded into the walls and the ceilings and just the kind of beauty in the, of the design and how the light casts and the murals that are created. Um, really inspired me to see that obviously that you can make basically anything beautiful with clever design and any resource and material can be like cleverly designed into like a really aesthetic way and it also um for me made me rethink what um a resource is and i wanted that to kind of i wanted to create a project that would translate that to other people um and then this is an, also another one which photo which really inspired me this room and the kind of bottles that are embedded in the dome ceiling so obviously plastic pollution is a big problem i think last year um china banned um uh the uk waste to landfills in china i think i think all uk waste but i'm not too sure um so there was a big kind of conversation about what the uk is going to do with the their waste where's it going to go and how do we kind of um use it um and how that's going to affect our environment as well and also a lot of, pe a lot of the um, plastic that we use not all of it is obviously recycled and plastic can only be recycled about seven times before it can't be recycled again so um, I think it was 
to last summer, yep, last, last summer, I basically decided to apply to do an installation at Brainchild Festival, which is a three-day festival that celebrates creativity um, and is kind of based on the DIY spirit of peer-to-peer -peer kind of leveling and creating things out of um, everyday materials as well as kind of well-constructed, um, made designed objects like the one in the photo. Um, and I proposed the idea to create a, a plastic pavilion um, that I wanted to design, which was gonna be about 16 square meters, which was gonna be an undulating canopy made, of, made out of recycled plastic bottles filled with colored water. And it was inspired by stained glass windows. And I was inspired by the idea of creating something as beautiful as maybe a mural in um, a church or a cathedral and getting that same kind of aesthetic feel, um, but through an everyday material that people don't um, high, regard as highly. Um, so kind of transforming a public space into a serene oasis and using this space to um, get people to rethink how they can change and design their public spaces and also create a more kind of slower and more engaged interactive um, interaction with the built environment and also use it as a therapeutic way of thinking about the public spaces that we um, interact with, um, how that can help with our well-being um, through the use of colour and design. And the project was hopefully, the aim was to hope to stimulate um, public awareness, obviously, of the wasteful consumption of plastic materials, but also look at the, um, the also kind of changing the narrative of waste material and that there is, isn't actually any, anything, there isn't anything, there isn't a such thing as waste material, that actually it's about perception and how you perceived a material and that one way, so, so, what someone might perceive it as waste, but can also be perceived as a resource if you rethink what the material can be used for. Um, so looking at, this was kind of start, this the installation was supposed to start the station of the creative uses. So this is kind of using a bottle in its ex exact same form, not crushed, not changed. But then also I've been looking and researching into how people have then developed that and carried it into circular design. So first I started off with collecting bottles. Um, I collected bottles for about three months, I think from March till May, um, with the help of my family, friends, um, people donating, uh, bottles along Kenish Town High Street, which is where um, I currently live, and my family live in Camden, London. And um, for example, bookshops, uh, estate agents, as well as going into my neighbour's bins, recycling bins, every Sunday before the bin um, collectors came, and actually going through their recycling. So whilst this um, period happened, I learned about learned a lot about why people drink bottled water. Um, either they don't, obviously don't think the water is safe in London for various reasons and drink bottled water and don't know about alternative um, ways to clean water, for example, filters, um, or just prefer the taste of bottled water, but also the willingness of people I learned to contribute and get involved in the project once they knew it was going to something communal and something that could um, um, be aesthetically pleasing. They liked the idea once they saw the pictures um, that they would actually help and um, the project but also I learned a lot about my neighbours and actually the hostile behaviour that people can have when it comes to for example going to their bins and trying to communicate a project some people are quite willing quite dismissive but also people are quite hostile and actually some people actually one person actually threatened me in fact um, before I explained to them what was going on so it's quite interesting to see that neighbour interaction especially in London where there's not that much um, neighbour interaction with, amongst each other um, and people don't actually know who lives where um, and then obviously it was to do with sorting the bottles there's a lot of different types of bottles and I wanted the installation to be as compact as possible so went into sorting them by size of like litres or millimetres and also shape which would help determine the layout of the pavilion in the end and then the form um, whilst I was collecting all the bottles um, I used Rhino to model the form. Um, I wanted it to be a very curved, um, undulating form and I was looking at curves that kind of oppose each other so that when visually you looked at it you'd see some concaves whilst others were um, concave and on, I can't remember the other word but yeah. So from this rhino model 
extracted a series of lengths of the strings, which turned into an Excel spreadsheet, which I was able to calculate the length of each string that the bottle would hang from. And then working with my friend who is a visual um, um, artist, Maya, who's also in the chat, um, we worked together to design the mural design. Um, and I was kind of so inspired from the visual you can see from like aesthetic kind of patterns, um, Aztec patterns from like Mexico and Guatemala. And the idea of like the spiritual eye or this openness and like seeing something new and the ideas of like awakening and realizing new meanings and felt like that really worked with the idea of changing people's perceptions. So changing people's eyes to what they see. Um, and I wanted it to be really colorful and, um, a rainbow kind of undulating slow change to really um, accentuate the curves in the installation. So on site at Brainchild Festival, um, it became kind of like a color lab where we had different people uh, filling up the, mixing the colors, filling it up with syringes. Each bottle had five, 50 mil um, of liquid and each, um, the liquid color was made from food coloring. So just the, uh, like normal food coloring you used for icing, of like on cakes or other foods. Um, it would have been nice to, if I had time to do it with natural dyeing, which would have been great. Um, but as I um, worked out the natural, so while someone was creating the natural dye, someone was also filling up the bottles and this kind of created a production line. There was about four or five of us um, installing over two and a half days. And how it worked is that, as you can see in this, um, on the left hand side. Um, this is two panels. So the installation was split into 15 panels. And these are two panels, one at the bottom and one at the top. Um, and as you, you can see how each um, bottle relates to the real life um, section as it went up. Each one had a code and related to, it was a big, a big mind game in my head which no one really understood which was quite complex and I think looking back on it could have been a bit more um, easier to delegate what was going on but it was quite a complex um, working out system and here are some photos of the final um, installation art at Brainchild so it became quite a popular um, destination in the festival um, there was morning yoga every day so people like to and it's quite it got quite hot so people like to use it as obviously shade which is great um, and people tend to sit underneath it um, uh, both in the night and during the day here's some photos of it close up um, you can see the colors here as they change um, from the center to the outer perimeter and here's a good photo where you can see the curve of the front curve kind of going down as the back one goes up. And it kind of actually, which I didn't realize, end up looking kind of like a sea creature or some sort of manta ray, which I didn't, and it actually moved as well in the wind and the rustling also created another additional effect, which I wasn't expecting um, and or an audio sense to it, um, which people obviously really liked to see this movement and it became its own being in fact. Um, and people actually saw it as a majestical creature, which was quite poignant in the fact that we're talking about plastic pollution, which has one of the biggest effects is on the ocean and sea life. Here's another photo as well, people underneath it. And then after Brainchild, it was wet light, was really well received and um, someone from the VNA um, came and contacted me to um, install it. At exhibition day, um, exhibition road day of design, which is happens part of London Design Festival, um, and it was going to be a street kind of festival, just celebrating and uh, architects, artists that promote um, using uh, recycled materials and sustainable resources to um, highlight the fact that um, there's a lot of like waste in society. Let's go page. And at the moment, the installation is at University of Hertfordshire, um, part of a group exhibition um, that um, explores plastics potential as inspiration material and a material resource and waste. Um, so all the artists in there look at plastic as something that can be treasured in the future and change the um, perception of it. 
Um, unfortunately, it obviously had to close because of coronavirus, so it's still there, and it was actually finished on the 18th of April, but it'll probably be there until the foreseeable future, until we can actually, can, well, until we get out of this situation. Um, and then just finally, I'm just gonna talk about a few other um, organizations and people who also work with uh, plastic that have inspired me um, whilst doing a lot of research into the topic. Um, one is Precious Plastic, which is, um, it's an open hardware plastic recycling project and it's an open resource, open source digital commons project, which basically was set up by a group of people to allow people to one, collect um, plastic, shred it, um, and create um, new products using molds. So they um, have an online guide, which is free to anyone um, to download um, on how to collect, create collection points, um, create um, molds out of um, metal and also to create shredders as well. So it's idea of kind of, they realize that there's a problem with um, obviously the system that a lot of the recycling companies are big recycling companies that you can't even access. I tried myself to even get a visit at one of them and it was really hard to even get anyone to speak to me on the phone about what was going on um, and create a more um, smaller factories based um, that are run by artisan um, people to create plastic that is from local communities or more locally sourced um, materials. Um, so here's some of the um, machines that they create um, from left to right. This is a shredder. Um, no, this is a kind of extruder that creates um, kind of string that you can use for 3D printing. This is a shredder. Um, this um, is a, I can't remember what this one is. I think it's also extruder and this one is a compression machine. So there's different ways that you can obviously make um, different molds. And here are some examples of people who've um, around the world, I think most of them are based in Europe, um, they've used the machines to create um, products. So I'm very interested in how people kind of use this as like a big Lego basically block to create um, walls exactly the same as Lego, that these components can be just like stacked up in, on top of each other. And again, some other people, again, who've used um, the same um, machines and methods to create these components to stack up. And I think it's interesting to think about why the architecture hasn't started using, obviously the systems aren't there and people aren't, there needs, needs to be more funding into people creating these products so that people can then use them in the built environment. Um, so it's exciting to see people starting to use it, but also exciting to see that the aesthetic, the aesthetics of these products aren't ugly, in my opinion at least, and that you can create quite beautiful um, components out of recycled materials. And also some people who are using it for um, techno, techno, uh, like speakers and other products um, through waste of using plastic bags. And at the moment with the coronavirus, it's obviously obvious that um, the supply chain, the supply chain that we're using, um, that we are in is out of date and unfit for modern manufacturing. Um, with the coronavirus, obviously the, when China stopped, went on lockdown, there was a problem of trying to get masks out or other um, products to, um, to around the globe. And we realized that obviously we need to decentralize um, our ma manufacturing. Um, system so that we can actually produce and we actually have everyone has the means to produce and create um, products um, and rethinking why everything is based um, in another country and why it's so globalized so um, for example precious plastic in their response to COVID-19 they've um, been helping their community and sharing resources which is the most important is about like sharing and democratizing um, knowledge um, and people have actually started using recycled plastic to create um, products for the coronavirus um, pandemic. So for example, um, this is in the UK, someone started raising money to create shields for the front line. And obviously a lot of like schools, for example, in DT workshops, have started using um, spaces to create um, products that are needed for the front line. Um, and here is another example of someone um, who is based in the Canary Islands, um, who's created using recycled plastic to create res respiratory masks. Um, completely out of recycled materials. And then again, um, a door handle, um, which is used, again, um, this is based in Switzerland, um, which is a hand-free door opener. Um, and then obviously I've been like, my involvement with it from um, the 
installation is I've been working with BFA, which is Black Females in Architecture. They're a network based in the UK, but have members globally, which is basically supporting um, black females in architecture, but they're very focused in looking at plastic. So they've been doing workshops with recycled plastic um, and looking at the techniques to make recycled plastic, but also looking at using it as a way to create um, other workshops, looking at identity um, <coughs> and making. And here's some other examples of other people, for example, Small Plastic, which are a functioning production company, um, manufacturing company, creating plastic um, sheets, um, both oh. to um, shops and bespoke furniture. And also Granby Rock, which I thought I'd put in um, because I've started working at Assemble um, Studio. And I thought this was a good example. And they have basically, they about, I think it was in 2000 and, what year but um, this is an example where um, Granby workshop which is based in Liverpool um, created Granby rock which is made out of rubble of like bricks and slate from roof tiles and created it put it into a mold to create a new um, artisan product and I think it's important to remember that it's not just plastic that we can use to create um, obviously um, products out of waste materials that there's other waste materials that um, people are using sample rock metals as well and even hair um people are using obviously hair for like rope and looking at how we can substitute um fishing lines which are a big problem in the sea and substituting plastic um materials for uh biodegradable materials such as hair and i just want to finish off with this um how this slide which is from um unseen architectures which was a talk that happened last week again on the part of the Architecture Foundation series. Um, and they're looking at um, the opportunities of privately owned public spaces um, in the UK. And um, they were gonna do the pavilion, the British pavilion for the Venice Biennale, Architecture Biennale. Um, and that these were gonna be the different rooms in the Biennale that they were gonna focus on. Um, and just looking at how, um, obviously we're talking about a decentralized um, Manufacturing system, but where can these manufacturing systems be? And now that we're in the pandemic, a lot of the high streets and a lot of spaces are being changed um, and might, might be changed in the future because people might not be able to restart their businesses. And obviously the high street in general is crashing and the, the future of the high street is changing in terms of what um, is being used there. So a lot of transactional uses are going online, for example. So these spaces are going to be empty and a lot of spaces, at least in the UK, are empty. So thinking what can these common spaces be used for and can they be an exchange um, of knowledge and exchange that people in the community can use. <clears throat> and during the coronavirus, obviously a lot of community action has been has started and there's hope that this kind of community action can continue on um, after um, the pandemic um, settles down and looking at how we can then um, repurpose these spaces and i'm really interested in the high street of exchanges in particular um thinking about where these spaces can be um not just for like plastics and waste materials but other exchanges of knowledge um and then finally just looking at the idea that if the in terms of aesthetics if the and the way that the architecture needs to respond to the climate emergency um it might be that a new aesthetic might evolve where there might be a patchwork city that is kind of moving away from the not like the normalized ideas of um beauty and actually is a series of you know people doing diy projects around the city creating um spaces um that aren't necessarily like fit together but are made from um resources that um, age well and um, are more like have a lighter touch to the environment and don't harm the environment as much and are locally sourced and actually we create this kind of natural urban eco ecology rather than a series of objects that are found in a man-made concrete um, built environment yeah and that's it for me <laughs> nice Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Shay. That Thank was amazing. Loved you. it. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome. Yes. Um,
thank you very much for this great presentations. Um, I like I have a lot of ideas of like what to talk about like in a big discussion after we had all the presentations because mm -hmm. I saw so many similarities to previous presentations we had like for example Panosmico or with my talk about purity um, and danger like when I kind of like brought up this um, quotes from this book by Douglas from the 60s um, mm -hmm. but um, if anybody has already like now any questions that like are urgent or that they want to have answered now please do so mm. yeah I think otherwise we um, just have the I, would have, I, would, I would have a question oh yeah sure Alberto yeah I would just maybe like to know a little bit about how is the the recycling industry kind of going because I mean uh, I hear that recycling plastic is pretty kind of uh, it's not so complicated mm -hmm. and uh, it's yeah, so it can be done e kind of easily but still I, I know that plastic is not being recycled even though you know you don't have to look for it it's basically everywhere so maybe just yeah. my question is like why is it why isn't the industry of recycling plastic actually thriving or or what's like a problem there with me yeah that would be my question um i guess because um i'd say the obviously the plastic recycling industry is working there is recycling happening i guess it depends on also the product that's being made so a lot of like um some plastics can't be recycled because there's different ways of creating plastic product um one which is like thermostat which means that once it's made it can't be recycled for example and then another type which can be recycled also it depends on the product if it is made up of various types of plastic you can't recycle that because obviously you can't mix different types of plastic together so there's problems in terms of maybe also the manufacturing side rather than the recycling side and what is being created and whether it's able to be recycled um and i guess um there's also a problem not that there isn't recycling happening but just because it's cheaper to create products out of virgin plastic so um to create materials out of recycled plastic just means that that company who is gonna buy it will just every, the product will increase in value and then less people will buy it so there needs to be probably subsidies for people who want to create products from recycled materials to allow them to give them a chance in the market. Okay. I mean, that, that would be maybe a cool idea for a project. Like if you, if you ask, I don't know, for a government project, then you would say that you work with recycled materials and then maybe it's more easier to like get finance, no? Because it's aligned, I don't know, something like that. So maybe it's a, yeah, as an as an idea because like you say, it's not it's not cheaper. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people, I guess, I guess it's about getting funding for it and to start it off because yeah, that's the main thing. It's to it needs government funding and support backing you. Um, like any kind of new product, it costs more at the beginning and it needs to become sustainable um, financially. Yeah. Have you have you thought of any like? kind of like startup that you you yeah you want to make make or something or uh, i don't know um i thought about investing in some precious plastic uh, machines which are some of the ones i showed you and looking at um ways of um creating um maybe build not maybe build components out of these materials but i haven't um researched enough into it um obviously it you need to invest to make a machine they actually have roughly how much you need to invest financially into each machine so you need to obviously save up for that and actually take it seriously it's not kind of a side project um but it's time consuming as well um to do it and collect the materials as well so it's a lot it's a kind of it's a working job in itself yeah thank you no problem. Okay, um, great. Um, I think then we can go to the second presentation of Andrea. Also um, based in London, I think, but now you are in Mexico, aren't you? You have to turn on your microphone. Yes. Yeah.
Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. No, I'm in London as well. Um, I my work is not very visual. That's why I I didn't prepare a PowerPoint presentation. Is that, is that okay? Well, hopefully, because otherwise I don't have anything to show <laughs> on the screen. And uh, what I'm my research is on. Uh, is on Aristotle's problem of catharsis in on his on, on his work on uh, tragic poetry and which is shown in the poetics and how Freud and Lacan help us to elucidate the problem of catharsis. At the, I'm at the beginning of the project. I'm on the first semester of the PhD, so I haven't. Um, I haven't like I'm not at the end of the project, so uh, I'm still kind of new on what I'm researching on. And um, uh, I do know what I can. Uh, yeah, what? Well, yes. So uh, if um, right, let, let me one second. Sorry, just like I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> Um, so uh, basically what I'm researching is like Aristotle has its own description of tragedy in the poetics and he says that tragedy is, tragic mimesis uh, is a, representa is, it is a rep representation of actions, actions, specific actions that um provoke us, provoke us fear and actions that are represented through represented through embellished language uh, which includes music and rhythm and the metrics of poetry and that actions that provo provoke us fear pity and fear and that through this emotion leads the audience to catharsis. Um, hopefully I'm being fair with Aristotle. <laughs> um, and uh, so I've been, uh, uh, well, no, I've been studying this for the last six months and I, what, what, I, what I think is like, like what I'm basically my question is what thing is represented that provokes catharsis because not everything that we see or read not every fearful or pity or not every fearful or or pitiful representation provokes fear that's the, that's the point that this is a very unique representation that leads to catharsis um, and in the chapter four of the poetics he he mentions that um humans enjoy one well, no, of he says men like men enjoy uh, mimesis for two reasons because basically because we have a like a natural proclivity to to engage on mimetic activity and because we also enjoy and because it's very pleasure because it's very pleasurable to recognize that this Thing is that I'm quoting him. Like, for example, um, he he mentions in the in the case of uh, of the in the case of of painting, like if we if we see a we recognize in the paint a beast 
so it's pleasurable to record to understand like he uses two two words which are of course in ancient Greek malfinite kaisi logistics type which I which are quite difficult to translate but basically could we could translate it as learning by inferring so it's not any kind of learning it's a learning which implied something that you know already so it's not like a new learning it's like a re yeah exactly it's a recognition it's like you learn something that you know already so that that's why he uses the case of of this pain like uh, and so that means that in poet that that makes me think that in tragic uh, poetry or in tragic representation something is recognized but what is recognized that leads to to an aesthetic experience of fear of pity and fear and finally to catharsis um, it's I, I i don't know i i i cannot i can no i i i can imagine what is recognized but i cannot i cannot say it for uh, for sure because it's part of my research but what i think that it, what is recognized in tragedy that provokes fear pity fear and catharsis at the end is the the threaten or or the break of the primer of the more essential boundaries between humans uh, which are for example parasite uh, or yeah parasite let's say i i don't like to use the example of i i was going to say uh, the, the example of um I, I don't really like to, to use example of of, of Dupuis the king because it, it's like kind of like i think our reading of Dupuis the king is very is very embedded of psychoanalysis which is not the case in aristotle of course because he says that the tragic character the misfortunes of the tragic characters are, are not a result of his or her will or virtue is a result of amartya which is a great word to explain that is something that occur by failure let's say also it's a kind of uh, by by is something that yeah that occur by by chance yeah or yeah by amartya is it's not so it's not like the character who is willing that those misfortunes occur and so so basically, I'm in this point of uh, of trying to know to identify what 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 are the things that occur in tragedy in tragedy that leads to catharsis to yeah to catharsis and um, and in the case of Freud. Uh, of how Freud can help me to elucidate uh, the problem of catharsis and the pleasure we take from tragic representation is um, I'm working with his uh, essay on um, beyond the pleasure principle and specifically with uh, 
with um, with the part where he explains that the for that game uh, of which is um, it is or it 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 is not is it is not there is do I'm translating correct. Uh, uh, do, is my translation correct like from from the german to english for that game like it está o no está which is in spanish it is or is not it there is not there for that do i'm translating it correctly the for that game like when well, no, basically he's explaining that a child a chi uh, uh, there's children there there's a child who is um, playing with uh, a bo uh, yeah a little a little book and through this play that the child takes a lot of pleasure from it. What uh, the child is doing is um, basically the game is the way the child. Uh, is the play is the place of or, or is the way yeah the child gives place to something very painful which is the the, the part of his mother uh, so through the play it's, it's something like the child is controlling the play so he's active in, instead of passive. It's like the passive position, it's when his mother departs and he cannot control anything of that. And that's very painful for him. So through the play, he can, like the ball represents like, uh, yeah, like the the mother and he, he decides when the mother goes away yeah exactly which is the best translation of for that the the ball goes away and he can take the ball when he wants so it's like uh, if if he could take control of when the mother goes away or come back and that's why it's very pleasurable so what this text is like this text help have helped me in terms of what I think also what is happening in like why it, there is a lot of pleasure in tragic representation that for me is like the pleasure of pleasure and one of like for me like let's see if I'm like I will find out if I'm correct or maybe I'm I'm, I'm, I'm wrong uh, uh, the audience or the reader take a lot of pleasure on tragic mimesis also because they are active in that position they are not passive because they are not so they are not suffering those misfortunes and they they are active in terms of they are they they are there seeing or reading that or hearing this the tragic uh, story because they want to um, and so therefore they can take pleasure from that experience and in the case of Lacan uh, he's helping me to um, I'm working at the moment with uh, he, the seminar seven which is the ethics of psychoanalysis um, and specifically with his interp interpretation of Antigone and maybe this will be a kind of a bit difficult to explain but I will do my best basically for him the pleasure in tragedy is taken is taken from from the possibility to cross 
to break the law without breaking it. So as an audience, you are there enjoying something that shows you how the law is being breaked. So the law for Lacan is, yeah, the pro these prohibitions that, like, he's very Freudian. These pro prohibitions that are part of every social of every community, um, and so what we he says that what we see in tragedy is uh, when like uh, when the law breaks and that the, that pleasure that that's why he says that it's kind of a pleasure that threatened pleasure in itself that we couldn't say that it's pleasure at all because uh, we take what what I think of what Lacan is, Lacan is saying is that we take pleasure of seeing something that threatens or not threatens it, like you see basically you are seeing how all of these boundaries or, or in Lacan terms the law how the law breaks and that is very I think the audience takes the, the pleasure of tragedy basically comes from that that's why and uh, um, Aristotle also mentions that in the poetics that um, the that tragedy poetry is more pleasurable than than comedy, um, and I, I I agree with him as well. And I think the reason is that that tragedy is dealing with the law. The law, as I explained, as all of these boundaries, like essential for for every social community, uh, and as a prohibition of incest or parasite, or with all of these things that we see in these ancient trage tragedies, as Medea killing killing. Uh, their children or uh, Creonte in the Antigone threatening the, the burial of someone uh, or pro prohibiting the burial uh, of, of someone actually very important. Um, or in the case of the big of the Oedipus the king killing his father and marrying, uh, getting married with his mother, and um, uh, one final thing I, I would like to add to this, like what what I worked this last week, is that in Aristotle in the rhetoric. In the book two of the rhetoric, he mentions that, uh, which is the tragedies on emotions, the book two of the rhetoric. Uh, he mentions that when fearful things or pity, pit, pitiable things are things that can be in another way. So, if we fear something, that means that that thing that we fear can be different. Otherwise, we wouldn't fear that. For example, if my, let's, let's imagine that someone of, of my family is very, very ill and I will fear that. But if they told me that 
that member of my family will die, I will not longer feel fear. It's just that it would be horrible, uh, but it will not longer. I, I will not longer fear because that will mean that uh, that situation cannot be different. And it's the same with pity. So what I thought is that maybe, like, because for me it's kind of, um, I've been thinking a lot of this, like, why if, if tragic poetry is a representation of actions in embellished language that provokes pity and fear, and finally we experience catharsis, maybe we experience catharsis because or at some point we experience, experience catharsis we we fear and pity through all, all the all the the play but at some point at some point we feel catharsis maybe because we are there's the point of the play that deals with something that cannot be different cannot longer be different when like when when the when which is the moment where where you see that the law has been broken i think so and sorry if i uh, if i was not very clear i i i didn't realize that um I had to prepare more my presentation. Just I'm at the beginning of my project and, and I'm not an artist, so I don't have anything to show <laughs> on the screen. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah. No worries, um, thank you. Um, I'm really interested in this like moment of the catharsis. Maybe you can explain us a bit like what it actually means when you pass through this moment of catharsis. Is it like, can you compare to like a religious moment of being enlightened or? Yeah. So basically what Aristotle, Aristotle um, concept of catharsis, uh, he works that concept in two, in two works, in the poetics and in the politics. And the politics is a work previous to the poetics. Um, in the politics, where, where he explains what, what music is for, and he said, uh, it's like the, the, the purpose of music is for education and catharsis. And when he, like in, which is like kind of, uh, in the poetics, he doesn't, explain anything about the about catharsis he doesn't give his um, definition of catharsis and because there's a missing part of the poetics but we can uh, we can deduce that he that concepts come comes from a religion like a, a yeah from a religious for he says that in the politics that catharsis like what music is used for the purpose of, of catharsis is like when uh, he says that some people is more uh, is more uh, have the inclination uh, to to like are like kind of more emotional as if they were passing through a religious purification religious purification he uses the word catharsis of course or medical purification so that word in ancient greek, uh, greek was Greece was used for, like had two uses in religion and in medicine. And uh, in medicine, if like it's very, um, 
is like the, the, the problem. Well, I mean, the, in the case of medicine, was used in terms of patho pathological. Um, yeah, it implies that there's a pathology, which is not the case of 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 tragedy, of course, because that will mean that there's a pathology, so something has has to be cured. And in the case of religious, I think he, I so that's why I think he. He uses it, it maybe just in the case of religious, like in the case of, um, he's thinking more, I think so, in the case of religion. Uh, but beyond if, uh, if the, that concept in medicine has, like if we think that Aristotle uh, is using that concept in terms of, in medical terms, beyond thinking that, because some scholars think that if we think on, the, on those terms, that will mean that there is a pathology. I think he, he's, he's just using that word for, of a metaphor of saying, as a metaphor, and he's trying to convey that something is being purged or purified or yeah or cured in terms of there's a like a, a balance like catharsis as a yeah as a purification Maybe it's like, it's not exactly of emotions because at the end, the emotions are the, like catharsis cannot occur without this, what, without the tension of these emotions. Actually catharsis occurs through pity and fear. And I mean, if there's no any tension, catharsis cannot occur. Uh, and yeah, um, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a, it actually it's a difficult part of my dissertation. I, what I, I can only tell you about catharsis mm -hmm. in the case of Aristotle is that he uses that in the politics in terms, like a, as a metaphor for saying that music is for the yeah. purpose of, of catharsis and that, yeah, it's like mm -hmm. a, he's using that concept as a, as a purification, mm -hmm. as purification or as yeah, one last, like here. Yeah, yeah. Maybe one last thing that is really interesting me, like when you talk about tragedy and mimesis and catharsis, I can't come around thinking about like, um, the pictures we see in TV, like from the hospitals and how we experience fear, but then how almost like in a like theater play, we go to our balconies and we clap to like the hospital workers. And I wonder if this clapping is kind of like a moment of catharsis from the fear we experience when we look at like this pictures from the hospital. Um. Um, I didn't, in the case, like, I, I know what you mean. I, I think, I don't think it, that would be a catharsis of that. I experienced, like, I, I, actually, I, exp I had like, an experience of, in my opinion, I had an experience of that in, in the earthquake of 2017 in Mexico City. And I think the... The people like you could, you could see the catharsis of, of the citizens in Me of in Mexico City, like, because it was a real tragedy that you could see like people, under the, uh, all of these buildings, 
and what I thought is like why like what I I realized that people was taking a lot of pleasure on helping others but not only for helping them also because it was a cathartic situation and as I wrote yesterday to you and Mariana maybe right now that clapping for me could not represent that clapping but I think people is taking pleasure people who's not ill of course <laughs> uh, from this all of this what is happening because they feel more close to each other and uh, so I think through this fear, through all of this fear of the COVID, uh, which is like, which for Aristotle actually, fear is a very self-regarding emotion because we feared something like if we feared um, uh, what we feared in in tragic poetry is something that we fear for ourselves is like that's that means that if we don't fear for the character if we fear is because we recognize something of ourselves in the character and and in the maybe case maybe of, sorry poets could also bring McLuhan in and sorry McLuhan Marshall McLuhan and his analysis of the medium because it's like, I think because what we experience when we look at like pictures on TV, we're watching more a reality um, than a play. But it's, yeah. it doesn't seem real because like, um, it's still distanced from us. Exactly. And Marshall McLuhan has worked a lot on like this effect on like, on media on, and um, the rep representation of um, reality in media and also mm -hmm. culture. And, Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, no, if I relate more my project with what is happening right now, as I told you yesterday, is that for me it's kind of funny, a kind of funny, what is happening is that for some, actually you can even see that in London, what I, like, I was explaining yesterday to Lucas and Mariana that, for example, in Mex I know that in Mexico, uh, in some areas the COVID doesn't exist like doesn't exist like because they for them is not something that they fear so they are having their daily life basically because that the covid uh, it's a like a kind of a far experience fear some to fear some something you have it you have to what is fearful is is fearful because it's near at hand and I think people, of course, not just in Mexico, in many countries, uh, have passed through many suffering that they cannot fear anymore. These kind of things, I think so. So, for example, here, if you go to the Turkish a supermarket the COVID doesn't exist there and because you you don't have to queue for enter to the supermarket and I, what I thought is that maybe 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 I'm wrong for the people who is is, is ruling the supermarket which are not from uh, the UK is like kind of absurd like to queue because probably they have passed through other experiences that are more fearful so that the COVID is kind of a very far experience and um, yeah I don't know I think as I told you um, uh, through as I told you yesterday I, th I think the isolation is also is an experience of fear exactly of of fear yeah because the isolation um, exists in certain areas in others 
doesn't exist. And yeah, and yeah, as I explained, like for example, as as a middle class uh, person, and probably here as everyone, like they their experiences of yeah, their experiences um, let them isolate because otherwise, if they have suffered like a lot, they will not isolate. I see Mexico, I think Mexico is a society that is very prepared for death. So in terms of that, they, they are very used to death. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think this kind of things as the virus is not very near at hand as other experiences. And it, it was very interesting, interesting what you say ab about Hamburg, that people, that, that you are seeing that as well because of their of other reasons. But it's very interesting that, I don't know, I would like to ask you how it is there. Like the isolation is not like, it's not like that because um, the health system can, cope all of the yeah yeah i think the thought which i had towards um how fear is perceived in society in germany at the moment was that um because the the we kind of like came to a point where we could control the virus as so far that the hospitals are not overwhelmed and we have now the first measurements of like um relief and like the first shops are opening again um when you talk to people now compared to like two weeks ago it seems that they're getting more lightheaded and that they kind of like seem like yeah um that they, that, that they perceive the danger in a, in a different way because you saw it's, it's again like a production of images i think which produced this perception yeah. of fear in the mind of people because the people in Germany saw the pictures in, in Italy from the hospitals which were completely like I mean it was you could see even like military cars like going to the streets and bringing like the the dead yeah. people to, 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 to the day graveyards mm -hmm. and um, this was really in the mind of the people and I think it's also interesting how politicians work with like kind of like this um, strength of language and um, pictures because um, there was like a leak in a paper from like the German government and in this in, the, in this paper they were working on strategies how to mentally prepare the population um, for the outbreak and how to sort of react to it and um, they actually wrote down in it that they would use to create fear in the population so that they would like um, react in a way that is going to stop the, the virus from spreading. And um, you can see this even now, like in this reactions from the politicians where we have like this first kind of like measurements that are like that the shops are opening again, but still like the politicians are obviously, they're not only working with fear, obviously, they're also working with like science. But fear is like really a component that helps the government to bring the population in order to, to combat the virus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I think I will open yeah. the discussion here. So um, if anybody has to say something, so this may be like a similar experience from their country. Otherwise, I would like to bring Panosmico in the discussion I'm referring to the first presentation because I saw a lot of similarities um, in between the work of Seichi and the work of Panosmico and how they're approaching projects. And I know that you now like through the second phase of your project with like Rio Bequera. So you now you did like sort of like this analysis of like um, the state of the river and you discovered like first kind of like signs of like what is of value in this river. So do you have already any ideas for the third phase of the river? Like I, I, I thought about Seishi's project because I mean, 
the third phase of your project will be some sort of like that you have like a physical installation or instrument that is like dealing um, with this issue of pollution and the state of the river now, isn't it? Maybe I share my screen and um, show also a bit of pictures from your project so that the people that don't know it see it as well. Yeah, um, we have some ideas about what's the next phase of the project. But basically, they are all based on the idea that garbage and pollution, they are an excess of energy, not a lack of energy. So they don't exist as a material reality, but as, a, as an ordering of reality by society. So in order to change the notion of of the people about a landscape that it's been polluted for a long time and, and in different ways, like by the government and by the inhabitants of the landscape and in, in general, anybody that goes through it. Uh, we've been thinking about working with, with the gases that the Rio Becerra expels because it's the same kind of gas that people use for cooking and heating water so it's curious to think that when you have an excess of energy what you what you produce is another kind of energy which might not be the one that can stem from water but the one that stems from the combination of water and uh, garbage. So that's one of the ideas to make a community kitchen that can make profit of, of the state of the river as it is. Because as is the same case as with the sea pollution, you can't uh, solve it by working only in one beach, for example, because it's a, a global problem that it's uh, that it's feeded by a lot of different actors. So the idea is not to solve the the source of the problem, but to work with the reality that you have in your locality. Uh, yeah, so then for us, I think the problem is not, it's not only what to do with the materials, because materials, of course, they have a very important, uh, a very important place in our daily life. It's there, it's polluting things, but it, it's also what these materials and the, 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 uh, what, like that, that the connection we have with them, which makes them be one thing or another to make them be a bottle that contains things or a piece of plastic that I call garbage. So it's kind of like also in the way that we, we establish a relationship with these materials that they become one or, or another. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we can do, we can do that uh, same reflection into bigger things, not only, you know, kind of, uh, samples of small small things that we own but also our surroundings so it's more it's more to trying to change the uh, the idea even the idea of pollution so what we understand as pollution then maybe we can understand it as something else we can understand it I mean our proposal is to understand it as a, a excess of energy then it becomes something else it becomes uh, a source a source of something um, that allows you to interact in a completely different way with uh, with a site a site in, in this case that it's really highly polluted um, and to erase in some in some parts these um, prejudices of of places like this or prejudices also in terms of what are 
yeah, how we establish the relationships with uh, with uh, with materials in general. Yeah, so, I think that in that sense, there there is a commonality with with the project we saw in the in the beginning of this digital temple, which has to do a lot with how people interpret uh, when you start dealing with their residues. And I think that's very interesting. And it's been interesting also in terms of the pandemic to see how people manage what they are uh, producing and then throwing away because it's how you see the relationship that people has with the environment in broad terms. What you buy, how you consume it, and how you get rid of it. And the different ways in which these categories uh, relate to the large environment to which we are embedded in, right? Like, if you decide to buy plastic instead of, of glass, and what can you do with your plastic and with your glass afterwards? It's also a reflection of what you think about uh, water or um, garbage recollectation. I don't know, there's like, there's that dimension of your private sphere becoming public that it's like softened by these kind of dynamics. I don't know what you think about that, Say. Um, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I feel like it's also, yeah, it's quite interesting when you talk about private, your private objects becoming public as well, because there's a weird interaction between waste and feeling like it belongs to you but also um an ownership of it especially um from my encounters with people and their bins and how they feel kind of possessive over them um and but also this idea that they also don't care about them this is a weird like contradictory kind of ownership of things that they don't value um i guess and yeah it's a representation it's also like a, of their lives um how they live and it is everything we um consume and we um put into the bins of recycling it is a representation of our like lifestyles so um it's quite interesting to see how that changes from different households and how that mm -hmm. that that byproduct of life evolves in, in different ways mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. I've, I had uh, some, of experience, some experience on uh, scavenging on other people's garbage and it's really, it's re I mean, the reactions you get are freaking amazing. I mean, some people, of course, they applaud you and, you know, kind of as, uh, I don't know, as if you were, uh, uh, and some people take it really, really bad because, and but that's the beauty of it. I mean, there's so much information in the, in the discarded things in the world and we're not taking enough attention, I think, on, on all of those things because suddenly when someone is speaking through your garbage, it, it, you know, it kind of like bumps to you that, oh, you know what, they can learn so much about me. Of course, because it's a reflection on who we are. Our garbage is the reflection of who we are as individuals and as a society as well uh, and that says a lot in in very different layers you know it, it says a lot about our income it says a lot about our um i don't know habits in general our clean habits our feeding habits um and uh you can kind of like break down and 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 and, and do very serious analysis on people just looking at their garbage um, yeah, may, may, maybe also, I mean, also interesting there in, in this kind of like garbage perspective is because, of course, you see it as a problem, right? You problematize it. And I think it's, uh, it's interesting, uh, the wording in this case, because uh, I don't know where I heard, but they don't have the word garbage, doesn't exist. And also then the way you perceive things is, is you, you don't see it as a garbage, you know, you just see a research, research uh, resource, sorry, and another kind of state of matter. So... I think I think good tactics to start with stuff is kind of like 
uh, yeah, just simple stuff like the wording. So if people just don't do not say garbage, but try to use another kind of uh, yeah, another kind of wording, another kind of system to their language, I think there then the action can come. So I think that that, that can also be like really important to to do as as uh, as I don't know like personal or collectively. Mm. Yeah, especially now with like as we were saying last week about language in terms of the coronavirus, how strongly it can influence people's behaviors and respond response to situations and topics. Um, like even if it was just, um, I feel like at least with the recycling that's happened in the UK was a big move, um, government scheme of like introducing recycling bins and the education on it. There was a lot of work done in it into like understanding that. Um, there was suddenly com compost bins, for example, and that evolved and people didn't understand what that was. And there's an education that, uh, and change in a language that needs to develop with that whilst as your perspective changes as well into something that's more nourishing and rather than disregard and using terminology that is more um, promoting um, of and valuing um, materials. So it could be an interesting way of maybe even like changing maybe the word on the bit, the big bins that outside our houses to like, I don't know, it's ever garbage or bin or like the lucky pot or something, something really like simple and silly that you could just start changing on your local high, um, road and start seeing it in a new light. It'd be quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, you address? Yeah, I would like to, uh, I would like to comment on the first presentation there. An idea that I have for long, um, what, is the, what is the responsibility of the artist towards um, these materials? Because what artists do is that we produce more and more products, we produce pieces, and uh, actually it's like we produce more material, and we do not use recycling materials to produce materials, we just produce materials from consuming other materials. So I think the artists have a responsibility into this, into producing more and more and more, and consuming more and more. So yeah, this is something that I have in, I'm, I'm, it's, it's in my mind for long now. And um, I have a responsibility. I bought new silicone to make my sculptures. I bought soap to make my sculptures. I bought, I buy things to make my sculptures and I do not use what is available from around. And uh, I think very important also is the naming also, is the wording. And um, because it, it, it's like you, um, it's something useful and you use the terminologies that are in the philosophy of, of um, either or and you do not use the philosophy that is neither nor like is useful or not useful so it's a garbage but if you say that something that you do not use anymore it's um, recycling is a recycling source then you give a possibility to the material so yeah this, this is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I also think like maybe in also in, in common to that, um, that we, we had this topic of the ownership of the garbage. And I think it's a kind of a sis like a like a strategy that comes often in um from from people who are driving the system. For example, like when we now have the climate crisis, they there is this new form of I I am doing the climate crisis when I drive cars or when I fly. And then I'm I'm hurting my planet. But I think, and then in the end, like the big corporations are mostly uh, responsible for for the biggest parts of it. And here also again, we're talking about the ownership of the garbage. So what what kind of alternatives do I have if I'm not privileged in in in, in financial matters to to go to this counter and buy something without packaging and that's like most of of the of the garbage comes from packaging in the end and we have we have so many working solutions um, and one of them I find it really beautiful is the the fund system the the pawn system in Germany for beer bottles which is uh, I think there for over 60 years where where you where you can where they collect the bottles back and they 
um, decided on this one model of bottle. Now, now we have big problems because um, some big companies try to raise their market presence by creating their own individual bottles. But there is the system of, of like this, this glass bottle is, is kind of a piece that can, can, could live on forever. And maybe this could be like also, if, if the system would provide those kind of materials um, then maybe you as an artist also, I mean, now you have to take a stand, yes, but I also think that the problem is coming from, from one level higher and we need to know how to deal with it, but also we need to push at the right points because we cannot change it. We can just like be one of the middle pieces inside of it and, and, and managing to let it flow through us as maybe a producer or user of it. Um, but yeah, what I, I think it's that, that that this problem is coming directly from from the people who are creating these materials and don't think about what it happens next. I'm buying the cheese with the pl plastic maybe or whatever, and I'm also buying the the, um, the the trash with it, and I have mostly no decision to not buy the trash. Yeah, yeah, there definitely needs to be. Obviously, at the end of the day, it's, it is systematic change that needs to happen. Obviously, a lot of the time when it comes to environmental issues, it's put on the individual to um, be responsible for the change when obviously, at the end of the day, the, um, it's corporations that have the biggest influence in terms of the pollution that's uh, produced. Um, so I guess a lot of people like, oh, for in order for that to happen, there needs to be new legislation in terms of in politics and in terms of what is allowed to be made in products and what isn't um and i think a lot of people when they're looking at like the green new deal etc is looking at, at that being implemented and um government kind of banning uses of certain material um for example in shops and packaging etc yeah, i just wanted to to uh, make a comment that for example i'm always very surprised how here in the netherlands everything is packed like uh, an aubergine has a uh, plastic wrapping which or, or or a banana for example which makes don't, doesn't make absolutely any sense for me because vegetables have their own wrapping already but it's this idea of purity again or or of cleanness right like um um that somehow because you have the privilege to go to a supermarket and, and, and buy something that you would expect it to be clean and sort of like untouched and, um, um, and healthy, then you have to protect it. Um, and then, yeah, you have, and, and that's like the, the sort of the first world uh, version of a supermarket, whereas in maybe, yeah, in Mexico, you go to the market and of course there, there won't be any plastic around your vegetables and actually right now in mexico city they they or i don't know if in the whole mexico but at least in mexico city they banned uh, the use of plastic um, um plastic bags uh which actually i think it's it's an interesting measure to to create awareness on um not using uh, or you overusing plastic too much but in a way, it's also um, kind of uh, uh, putting away the problem instead of um, asking ourselves, okay, you know, plastic is just one part of, uh, of, of, of our waste, no? Uh, what can we do as a system that is working much better? And in that sense, too, to also, like, go um, in the line of thought of Andreas, I think that, of course, as artists or designers, we always have the responsibility to work uh, with different types of uh, materials that are, yeah, both uh, sourced locally or recycled, or um, that can create new materials. Like, for example, you guys, Panosmico, were talking about creating like a biodigester, for example, a kitchen with with with, with the gas waste of of of. Uh, of the river, and I think that's great because you sort you you need these examples somehow, and that all as a collection also become part of a solution and something that is happening 
um, here in Amsterdam that is quite interesting is that, for example, um, we have a big problem with uh, bread waste uh, because um, in there, there are some neighborhoods where people are wasting a lot of bread and they're putting them on the street. Um, and that brings a lot of plagues and uh, well, food waste actually is also a big problem, not only uh, uh, material, but food waste itself is uh, also a big problem. Um, and now uh, there is a whole system on collecting, for example, specifically bread in some neighborhoods to make uh, biogas out of that mm -hmm. for uh, certain community centers. Mm -hmm. And that started as a community project and that kind of like escalated to a uh, policy level and now it's being tested as sort of like a re reproducible uh, system. And I think that's the important um, aspect of, of kind of being uh, sort of like a mediator, no? Like if, if you can as a creative or as a community of, 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 of creatives and scientists and experts uh, create these solutions, you can definitely talk to policymakers to, to start to kind of um, reproduce some systems. So I think that can be possible. It's just about kind of visualizing what is not there, which is a bit, yeah, I think what, what, what is our, our job in the end, no? <laughs> Agreed. Um, I just want to say something regarding what the, the presentation of Anosmico. Like for me, which is very interesting, is that you are not trying to get rid of the problem, is that you are integrating the problem, it's like integrating the failure which is for me is a very interesting proposal. It's like, what reminds me, it's um, two, two texts I read. One of Etienne Balivar, who is writing about the state and violence, and he's saying like, a, a political philosophy for many uh, decades have tried to try, have tried to think of a system that gets rid of violence, but we have to integrate violence because violence will, will always exist. So for me, it's very interesting that you're integrating the failure. It's not trying to get rid of that because that will exist. And I think that could can open new routes. It's very interesting to me. And also a, about the presentation, presentation of say, uh, uh, I, 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 I don't know if it's possible to know a little bit more about what happened of this community collection, of this collection of plastic bottles in your neighborhood. For me, it's very, I think it's, it's an interesting um, way to do things because yeah, uh, and also maybe th th this is related as well with what Javi said already, um, because think in terms of community is is like uh, like like it's a, a different way to appropriate things. Like it's completely different of how the system is ruled by pri private property. And like for me, it was very revealing in, for example, in the manuscripts of Marx, when he says that the, the, wor the, yeah, the worker is producing something for someone else. The product is he's working on is not his product. It's not like in the case of, of us that what we are producing is our, is our, yeah is our creation uh, and of, because the worker is producing something that is belongs to someone else of course everything is is like of course the others is are a threat for himself um, because that thing that he's working on is very is, is not like is not part of himself 
and yeah so i think work in terms work in community it's a different way to appropriate things and yeah Yeah, I think it's really interesting this point of appropriation because also like in our urban design studies we thought about like what makes um, like a, a specific public space valuable was that there was some possibility for the community to appropriate it. Mm -hmm. So the aspect of appropriation is not to underestimate when you sort of speak about giving value to something. And I was also thinking about like the language you could use to um, to give value to race. So um, say she was like referring to sort of like like she was producing some images of religion again, like when she was speaking about like the stained glass window and um, about a creative spirit. Um, so there was like again this sort of language being used that we also use for the church temple. You kind of use like this spiritual language to kind of like build on on a tradition of thought that is giving value, um, but in a really specific way. And we also had like other people talking about today about like this dualism in like giving value to one thing and not giving value to the other thing, and then the other thing is debased. So um, that was just another thought I had um, um, on this language issue. Yeah. So, uh, coming back to to the to the spiritual language, we had this um, talk. I think um, it was the last talk, or what, where we were talking about how purity can lead to negative things. And we, I think, I, I, I said about whether that this, if you have a certain kind of fantasy that you cannot live out because something is forbidding you to for, forbids you to do it there is coming perversion out of it. And I find this um, picture of the aubergine or banana and plastic wrap that Mariana told us about uh, has this kind of perversion to it since, since it's also, it's, it's a virgin fruit. Nobody ever touched it before me. So when, when I get the fruit, it is as pure as, as yeah. <laughs> and I, I find this really interesting how, how this correlates to each other and how what it what it makes in our mind to be to be the first to touch it like what what kind of where, where does this thought come from is it really something that comes out of the human um necessity of things like um if, if you would give it to a nature living folk would they also always prefer the stuff that is new or is it maybe in my opinion a very capitalist um created narrative of what makes a thing good is it being new and as so so the newer it is and um, the better so I, I like this like this back twist uh, of maybe how people always want like the virgin woman and like this um religions um uh, this pure woman's not virgin women's but pure women's um even if they're not virgin they have to be pure somehow mm -hmm. it's correlating i think yeah not, just, not only just, but, huh yeah. Sorry, just to provoke. Okay, let's just stay with the image of the banana wrapped in a in a plastic, and then think about a condom which is wrapping a dick, also. But it's the, the kind of like a very not virgin, you know, image of the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's an that's an advertisement for condoms here in Germany. I saw it not not too long ago. Fruit. Yeah fruits with condoms over it. I also think that it, it has to do with the quality of the transmutation of the materials. <laughs> because if you think about it, there's nothing new. There's only work over things, over matter. So the, the better you are in transmuting matter in the same religious language that we are using, the purer they become and the more desirable they become. Yeah. So it's about being a good illusionist, right? Or a magician. And I think that's one of the things that I like about Say's piece, that when you're looking at the bottles from below, the colors and the shape of the plastic make them look like flowers. 
And I think that kind of effects have a very strong uh, impression on people because that's the, the best weapon of art, right? As Andreas kind of was showing, like when you <laughs> use something that it's not what you are representing, but you use it with the delicacy and the expertise enough to make it look what you want it to, to represent, then it becomes fuck that that is horrible man. <laughs> like the campaign. <laughs> yeah. Mariana? Yeah, I, I I just wanted to like add to a point of this purity, like virginal um uh idea, no? And and I think Seiji was referring to to her presentation about like the plastic um how and how it's being uh re re yeah re reconceptualized in a very aesthetic way and i think yeah that's what you were saying also no like aesthetics also uh play a very important role no and uh, i was talking about food before and food waste for example is like one of our like half or one third of the food that is being produced in the world goes to waste because it's not beautiful enough um, so that just tells us a lot also about how we as consumers want to relate to what we are putting into our bodies or what we are a uh, kind of surrounding ourselves with no mm. and that, that would be like another question that i also had to see his talk or maybe like a uh, like a comment also because you were talking about this education um, through experiencing the material and we were talking now about the surroundings and I, I think like a really big topic in, in urban space is, is the fakeness of our surroundings how they pretend to be something like even if it's um, the fruit that needs to be new and then we come now to this point where um, Malolo also used the word transmute which also comes out of alchemy language and I think who who you, you called it like a magician and then the words of Michael Dudek which we had the how to temple talk with um, who himself calls him also like a cultural engineer he says like magic is still there and magic is the kind of storytelling so by telling someone okay this is pure this is this is new this is what you what you desire and you tell the story so good and this is what advertisement is doing you you plant the seed in the head of another person and that is in some way magic and we we tell our each other like stories also through architecture and in Germany and um, in Hamburg we we are called the brick city um, or they call themselves the brick city each new house needs to somehow have bricks and all of those bricks are like um, how, how you how you call it uh, if you put just paper on the wall um, that's um, what's the English word for it uh, you know like a like a layer of paper on the wall can somebody help me before I need to google it Wallpaper. Yeah. Yeah. wallpaper wallpaper so most of the buildings are um just just like concrete those are the old ones that's why why we want them to look because we have a world cultural heritage but all of these new buildings they are in a concrete core them, yeah. they are steel concrete buildings like all of them um and then they get like this kind of nice wallpaper around it so they look like they're made out of brick and all of these bricks are oh you just, okay yeah. and hold, hold up with metal on this steel so we are telling the people also through that like a really nice story of yeah we are we're still building houses with bricks and that's making it not so drastic maybe as if we would only see all of these brutalistic buildings that they are on the inside and that's for me like with, together with the with the wrapping around the aubergine in the end the matter inside of the wrapping doesn't really change but it tells a very different story and this is to understand who is telling the stories why are they telling them and what the, the agenda is it for, for them to tell these stories is i think the biggest part that we all need to work on to to show what the fake things are yeah i think there needs to be like a more, more transparency in terms of materials obviously that's a big part of the architecture facade 
I feel like before I even studied architecture, the idea of facade, um, the idea for that was someone who got a mask on or pretending to be something else. Um, so the idea that like the word facade is something that a lot, especially in the built environment is used as like, uh, kind of, we do the same, maybe not with wallpaper, but with like uh, concrete or steel um, frames with a bit of brick about two centimeters deep on the, on the surface. And I think as the world is evolving, not just both like for, because of capitalism, but also social media and, and other in other platforms, everything's becoming more aesthetically driven. Um, there's less care or um, about actually the process of what's happening, what's actually happening in a deeper surface. And I think there's becoming a shallow, a shallowing of just ideas and interest. And I think a lot of the time, at least with the pavilion, when I did decided to do look at it as a spiritual kind of awakening is about connecting back into deeper roots of understanding and wanting to know more and understand process and feeling and have a more connective connective experience with things and places and environments so it's just I feel like it's about getting people to change their values I guess when you're talking about in different um communities where maybe the new isn't valued i guess if you think about like heritage or or like heirlooms that get passed down generations by generations usually that at least used to be something that was really valued the idea of something new wouldn't like stand against something that maybe was passed down your generations and was looked after and had meaning to it so i guess meaning comes back into the play the idea of meaningless things becoming quite um sought after rather than um the idea of time and also fast production, I guess time is part of that as well when thinking of quickness and um, and in attaining things rather than slowness and valuing um, and a uniqueness in things that you um, accumulate, I guess, which is a problem. Accumulating sounds just like, I just more information, more information, more things um, and not an understanding of what them things are. Um, and I hope that maybe in this time when we slow down, there's time to when people are starting to um, do activities that are slower. Um, there's uh, hopefully a awakening in terms of um, I've lost my train of thought. There's an awakening in slow processes and not a need to consume. I guess saw someone sent sent me something. I'd be like. You know, you just want to consume, consume more until what, until what, like we're trying to attain more information, but never really trying to absorb any of that information. So just trying to flip that idea of um, to attain more, you therefore have more standard or more like social um, hierarchy. What is the idea of more um, in society? What does that mean to us? I like the what you said also about accumulating. Um, one of the one of the I think it was the Biennale 2018. Uh, no, yeah, 2018. The British Pavilion released like some postcards with like um, thesis on on households or on on the domestic situation of humans. And one of them was the house is a machine for capital accumulation. I found that like a very interesting point of view um, that you have this kind of place that you just use sometimes to put it up with stuff and just like just like a comment on it um, regarding to that um, I was seeing a super nice um, meme which got me like okay economy is going down right now because people stop buying shit they don't need to buy because normally we go out and buy more than we need and now everything we find out everything is built on these cloud castles. Yeah, and I've, there's a, there maybe is a shift towards consuming, towards making, and a lot of people are doing DIY households, they're looking after the spaces that they live in, which they usually don't spend much time in. So um, looking into spending time to create rather than to buy is also an interesting shift as well. Um, I guess that just, is a reflection on how we live our lives how the fact that we don't have enough time to we outsource other things that we the things we can't do mm. yeah 
maybe and I would I would have maybe just a kind of question with accumulation because yeah I, I, I think accumulation is a problem when it happens uh, when you do it you know more than you need but that's kind of a question that that, that I think everyone kind of has and it's like until which point I have to accumulate a certain amount of something you know and I think that line is also sometimes difficult to 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 draw because, I, for example, uh, I'm really right now thinking a lot about uh, the nest of, of, of birds and how they, they, uh, they go to different parts of the world, you know, they fly, and then they come back with a little piece of something, no? And what they are doing is basically they are accumulating this, this uh, yeah, this little, little home. And it's, uh, and like Marcelo says, it can have like this really negative uh, connotation, like, yeah, home is uh, uh, and can be a machine for, for capital accumulation. But, but also, it, we take it to, when we take it, the thought to the extreme, no? But also home can be this nest yeah, that people, you know, they, they just gather, they just accumulate uh, the, the, the amount they need for certain things. So uh, I, I think it's just interesting how, how does each person or each collective or each uh, company deals with accumulation. And I think, uh, I think that the question is interesting. And so when, so when should you grow and so when should you like you know so i think it's also the question is like when exactly and when is that line with accumulation yeah i would say, I would say one just just a quick comment uh, that that this point is like when you say people accumulate that much that they need uh, i think you have to rephrase it to people accumulate that much that they think that they need because uh, referring to what we said earlier um, the story on how much you need or what kind of items you need is, is one that is really distorted by advertisement and society uh, societal values societal values yeah so that that is that I think that's step one to find out what do I really need and then you can accumulate as much as you want but uh, I think it wouldn't be that much as it is right now Yeah, I mean, at the end, at the end, I, I like this word that uh, C C says patchwork, in your in yeah. your in your presentation because uh, it's like like a like a favela, like this concept we also have in, in our collective. We talked about the favela, and it's like how these little villages are made. You know, like people bring a, a little piece of wood from the they found the, the little piece of metal, and then they bring a tire, and then. They, they're like this little bird you know, making their nest and they just used kind of a recycle with a kind of recycling method their little the little accumulation of matter and 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 they do it to the and in this in this in this kind of sense what they need the question is yeah exactly what they need but the how much do they need you know they need just a roof and a thin wall and maybe just a dirt uh, dirt ground so the, also the question of how much do you need is really like bendable for each kind of person, no? And I think that that has to do with maybe the lifestyle of each person and how, how much they, they, tend, they tend to accumulate for whatever they think it's important in their life. But also I think that um, think in terms of what, how much do you need is all again address the issue in terms of individuality, which is a, a way to perpetuate uh, the capitalist idea of the individual. So it's not like, that's why for me it's very interesting uh, the Panosmico proposal, because I think we have to integrate the idea that accumulation will exist in everyone in this system. That's the thing, like in this system, there's like the system is part of us. That's the thing. It's like as uh, Mari. I think it's it's related with Mari. What Mariana and Manolo presented, like that dirty river, is part of a death project. It's not like trying to clean the river. We have to think that in this is the system. Like we are an effect of the system. So I think we shouldn't, I, for me, it's not that we shouldn't address to the problem in terms of individuality of what do people, what people need, but um, 
because basically we are driven by the the values of the system because it's very uh, valuable to accumulate and also uh, other thing I, I thought uh, about uh, Sergei's presentation is that which is interesting is to use uh, the the recycle these these materials that has been this material like that are part of a past let's say because it's a way to show that this press in this present in this present let's say new object is the heaviness of the past and that, that basically remind me the the walter benjamin text of the thesis of philosophy of history that he basically is criticizing uh, this idea of uh, that history is like a, a logical accumulation of of facts and he's saying like the present like this past for, well, at, at least is what i understood this past uh, uh, this past situation codify this moment that is occurring 500 years after, for example. So this present, um, this this present thing is not far from this uh, fact that occurred 1,000 years ago. So the present object. I thought is it's interesting to use these materials in a new like in a new object because it's trying it, maybe it's like uh, I don't know maybe it's a it's a way that integrates um, Benjamin ideas of of the critic of this of history as a, an accumulation of of facts that are not related to another and um, yeah i don't know if I, I was clear about it yeah but i don't know if it's on the same track but we definitely have a very history-based practice uh, material history and political history are part of the things that determine how we relate with spaces because as a collective that is not working always on its uh, birth land or the place where we live we have to research about the places where we uh, execute enter. our practice or enter and it actually has to do with working with the different layers that you can find in a space to understand its dynamics and it's not about natural dynamics that we are thinking about but the intertwining of a natural context and cultural uh, influence and like transformation of a space so in order to do that we have to know the most that we can about the place so we can actually interact with these things uh, with some knowledge behind it um, and it actually has to do with, with communicating that, that stuff to people uh, that a lot of times even though they are the native people they don't know it and it's about this ignorance that neoliberalism and capitalism wants us to have to not be in contact with with these spiritual things that say you was talking about or with more thorough experiences of landscape to obey only the artificial landscape that is the one that it's made uh, with publicity or market <laughs> uh, uh, programs 
or stuff like that. So in, in that same sense, it has to do uh, with what Andrea is saying that a lot of the times those conditions are, are miserable and they are like polluting conditions and extracting conditions and destroying dynamics of, of land. So part of that is accepting what we are in and not what it should be, right? Like not what we could do if things were like this or if things were like that. This is the hood where we worked with Lucas in Palermo. And as you can see, there are some very beautiful things and some very fucked up things. <laughs> and this guy, the guy with the cap, he was like a great researcher that managed to map the whole underground system of uh, underwater canals that once feeded the whole city and made the city a garden and possible, yeah. So in a way, like he's an, an archeologist, but he's also a kind of artist because he is doing like dynamics that no one else is doing, right? Like this spot is the place where one of the canals was born or was uh, thrown into so that the garden that we saw previously could be feeded. Mm -hmm. And it was forgotten for a hundred years. And he found it along with the Fra Mauro, which was the, a religious man, but a very cool one, actually. Yeah. Also, I wanted to say something about necessity, which I think it's a really important topic. Uh, because necessity in itself it has a context. You cannot just talk about what you need or what like necessity comes from because it's very complex. It has to deal with with the context, and that context has so many layers to take into account to talk about necessity, uh, why we feel we need something, or what that's what, what's that feeling coming from. It's, uh, I think it's a really important topic to address in, you know, in, in our, even in our current situation. Um, in, t in terms, I don't know, I was just thinking about also all of the rubber gloves discarded in this time for, for, for COVID. Yeah, what's, what's happening with all of the pollution that is produced by this pandemic? Yeah, what's going to happen with all of that latex okay. and all of those, uh, you know, kind of like medical waste. Uh, I don't know, because they first are produced because there's a necessity of, of this stuff, uh, because, you know, kind of like this idea, they protect us, and then they become a problem. So it's kind of like a, you know, a, a continuous circle of, of nonsense, you know? It's, it's, it's just, I think the problem is just we're too many people in the world. Which is like you know we need less than half of the population, and then you know kind of these all of these conversations will disappear, and we can and we can address some new ones, very more much more interesting than these ones, I think. But um, yeah, I guess it's I think it's really important when we talk about necessity to really make an effort to go very deep into the concept of. Uh, where is this? Where, where is this coming from? What is what is necessity saying in each aspect of our daily life, and how does that work? Not not just individually, but collectively as well. And not just mate, material necessities. We have necessities of of you know a variety of, of, of types. You know, we have emotional necessities. We have um, and though all of those produce stuff, uh, and they have an effect in our daily lives. So. Yeah, um. but that's that's why that's why also I kind of like make uh, make uh, uh, I make a comment in this because the necessity we 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 are now creating for for each one of us you know the one that each one has to like kind of reevaluate what things in their life they need and what not is mm -hmm. gonna set the limits for whatever you're gonna accumulate in this next year of your life you know so I think for so that's why I say it's important that we kind of react re re 
yeah, rethink what are these necessities. You know? And everyone kind of like has to see that uh, what kind of things in your life you can actually live without. And, and that's gonna draw the lines back or forth, you know? And to see what, what, is, what is that you need to do this in a year or in your life to, to, to achieve something. Uh, you know, money maybe is not so important now as other things. Or uh, you need to accumulate maybe not so many titles in university, but what you need is soft skills. And so I, I think the whole concept about what you are gonna gather from the world outside is just gonna be, uh, it's gonna be dropped in different things. And uh, again, we're gonna start a new kind of a, a new uh, journey into accumulating different, different values and different uh, elements from the world. And I think that's the question right now, like uh, what, what is gonna be that? And, and what, what, it's, what it's gonna look like, yeah. The necessity of each one of us, yeah. Yeah, but then I guess like following on from your point, necessity or needs will always change and evolve, one with context, but also through life. So I guess that the fact that you can never just have your needs will always change. So the idea of like individualism and like needing different things, therefore the things that we accumulate will change and things will need to, we need to relinquish some things to in order to make room for other things. So I guess that will always happen. So the idea of like, sometimes in the past I thought, I thought, you know, I'll just have just enough and then I won't need, I'm actually present sometimes of someone who buys a lot, I tend to hoard. And then there's a problem of hoarding and having too much in your space because you want to create a space that never needs to be replenished of new things or need of new things and have a sustainable space. Well, obviously evolution means change and evolving of things and coming and going. And I guess it's about not trying to, like for example, in individualism is always going to be here and needs are going to change, but creating the systems and collective systems and reproductive systems that allow these needs to evolve and adapt in a sustainable way and so like the pandemic for example the masks like just today actually just before this meeting my mom works in a supermarket she bought back a handful of plastic gloves and a handful of plastic and masks and I said who's going to use these she said you never know someone might need them I was like but you know you can get a one mask a cloth mask that you can put in your face and wash it and reuse it She's like but someone might need it and I think it's the idea is that it's there so just take it and that was the idea and the thought process behind it. And I get it and I understand it's helping other people and it's the idea of just, there's excess, just take it. And there's this understanding that um, just to have it just in case and the idea of even just, for example, the pandemic of creating one solution, not one solution, but like instead of creating masks that are going to get thrown away or um, plastic gloves to create products that actually could either be recycled or can be used multiple times. Um, there is a way of creating hygiene and cl like cleanliness that doesn't evolve um, dis disregarding and throwing away. So it's just, it's, again, it's the thought process. Yeah, I, I think what Say said um, is very important because I, I will I will say it again. Like, think in terms of what we do do we need is all is again things in terms of in in individual terms, which is like think again on like uh, on capitalism terms. It's not like the the problem is not the people who is consuming. The the problem is not that we are too many people because actually our companies, which uh, are the main cause of uh, the footprint, because I do not decide to have a computer that will la will last for six years. I I cannot decide to buy a I if I would like to, I I cannot decide that my, the things I buy come wrapped or not. So the problem is not me in India or the people who is buying too many things. I think the problem is are all of these companies and the owners of the companies. Basically, like for me, it's always very important. Like, no, it's not people who is uh, creating the... Uh, 
the environment problem are the companies actually who are creating the environment problem because they create products that will last for a few years that are obsolete and we cannot decide on that and also is we cannot decide in the system we are living in i think things will not change in my perspective until we live in a until that we live in another system not, or a system different from from a system ruled by prior private private property I mean, I think, I think, I think that I think, of course, uh, I think the problems, society problems, are obviously always super complex, and you cannot say that something has the problem, you know, like something specific. Um, but you know, like I think ch things are going to change. Like I, I told my friends today in a message, like uh, uh, we always talk about post, uh, post fo fossil age, you know, because we it sounds kind of cool, and you know, it's like a nice concept to think about. And and today, uh, yesterday, today, like the the oil, uh, yeah, the oil indicators, whatever, put the oil in, in minus minus twenty, thirty dollars in some places, and actually things are changing, and and that's why I think every, everyone kind of like really needs to kind of see that it's it's just another time, and it's gonna happen little by little, and things are going to definitely gonna change, um. This is just another another time, I, and it's gonna come slowly. I think so. Uh, definitely, there's gonna be changes, and all of this kind of stuff is gonna happen. Uh, like recycling materials, and how do we have with green energies and green politics are are gonna kind of like uh, be the new future. So it's just also interesting maybe to see what is actually gonna happen with the, everything they sign in in. And and uh, the the governments, you know, like the local governments, and what's what's the new changes? Because I see I see a lot of stuff that's gonna happen, and it's also kind of not not easy to know exactly what what that is. Yeah, for me it's really difficult at this moment to. I mean, it's it kind of corresponds to this current scene map of mine, like who are the winners and losers of this time, and it's really hard to point out like whether the winners will be like auditorian right wing or it will be topics that are more about solidarity and different concepts of living and i see at the moment science for in favor that speak in favor of auditorian measurements and auditorian leaders and operating with fear which we talked about today as well with um, aristoteles and how how fear is actually used as like, I mean, it's really used to bring people behind you in, in a certain way, not only fear, but also hope. So that's, I think fear and hope really go like hand in hand um, at this point. But um, I don't see like this narrative, like this, um, like, I mean, I, I sent you like this videos today from, from TikTok. Like I got into TikTok now because I was bored about um, like all of this. And looking in this like, um, and I, I didn't got it first because it was just teenagers dancing. But then I looked like into, into the politics session and it was really interesting how in US politics, like um, TikTok is used to actually, like a lot of like young people like, on the yeah trump supporters and sender supporters were like creating like kind of like this um small videos and some of them were like really mean like there was like this one republican girl like kind of like having like a hip-hop song and um like the guy was like the, in the hip-hop song the guy was not really understandable so he was like mimicking joe biden like kind of like he's so old nobody understands him when he's talking and then like when the when the hip hop song was really in the flow it was like okay yeah that's trump so it's really interesting how they use like really kind of like the same mocking mechanisms that trump is using in this polit politics also like on this like small video platform tiktok and like in these videos and i just think it's really interesting how how this communication kind of like contributes to to like who is creating the most convincing narrative 
And I do think that the right at the moment is better in creating convincing narratives. Well, are you convinced? I'm not, but I'm convinced by them. Like, I'm not convinced by their narratives, but I'm convinced that their narratives are clearer than the narratives on, on the left. Then we have to make better ones. Yeah, we have to yeah. fight clearer enemies. So we need to get into fucking TikTok. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. We do. Well, are their narrations better just because we're living in a system that really kind of supports them anyway? When you're trying to narrate something that's new that is outside a world that you're not used to, it's harder to convince people. So you probably just have a tougher job in narrating a new storyline rather than retelling the one that's already happening or exaggerating it. But most of the great storylines come out of these times of struggle. Mm -hmm. like, like the, I'm, I'm always referring, like some people could believe that I'm a Christian, but I like, the, I super like the idea of the story of Jesus, of this like, he was like the Che Guevara of that time, you know, and he, he, you could really believe in that guy, that, that he was like a hero. And it was a different story at that time. And maybe it's also a time, it's a time of upheaval. Maybe there shouldn't, there needs to be another story. And I think it's, it's about, about people like us telling that story. I'm not saying that we should write the next Jesus, but you can like, just whatever you do, act like if it was holy. And maybe it gets... Maybe it happens to be, who knows? And it's interesting, like half of the videos on TikTok from like the conservative um, Trump supporters are actually about Bible phrases and why those Bible phrases like um, should um, like end abortion laws. So they're working a lot with like kind of like religion and religion phrases as well on, 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 the, on the right side and politics. Um, obviously, like out, out of a different tradition, they're not trying to invent a new religion. They just lean towards the old religions. But um, yeah, so I think that's why it's really interesting to bring in like this talk about the digital temple and about spirituality and also using this kind of like history of spirituality um, to create new narrators. Yeah. Nice. Well, we are today, today we had two hours and a half, so I don't know, how are you feeling? <laughs> yeah. I have a question for, yes. the, uh, for the crew of the Digital Temple owners. Well, not owners, but provocators. <laughs> it's provocators. Space creators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right. the, the, key, the key guys, you know, only the guys the with the keepers. The keepers. We don't yeah. own anything here. They yeah, wrote it out like the keepers, no? Like, didn't we? The sharer, the holder, or the keepers? <laughs> I'm, I'm the cleaning lady. I'm the cleaning lady of the digital temple. <laughs> the digital temple lease. Uh, my question is what's the next step for this digital temple? I mean, it's been amazing to chat with all of these diversity of people and points of view and everything, but uh do you have something i mean have you thought about maybe a next a next dynamic or something something else that we can do i mean because i'm thinking that we're gathering like a lot a lot of information in each one of these conversations and uh i'm starting to feel that you know kind of each uh um, sensation that we need to probably I don't know, do something with all of that information because if not, it's just, you know, we are doing exactly the same with, the, with, with our words and, and thoughts that we're doing with the plastic bottles just thrown mm. into space, you know, that they're just there kind of polluting the, the air and our minds. Our temple, <laughs> polluting our temple. temple. Good point, good point. We, and now we, the digital we, temple is just a pile of shit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a holy, it's a piece of holy shit. I, and I just want to say, I just want to add in the cow shit. I would say that that's, that, that, that uh, I, I wouldn't totally agree with that. Because when I think about this situation, I, when I think about this situation about are we really creating uh, just the more information into the wave of information, I think, I think the very important thing that I like about the digital temple is that there, it's a space for not only talking, but for, for listening. 
And in this process where there is a dialogue, I think that is very, very different from just uh, posting a video about a content. And for, for me, at least your question would be, uh, I would respond to the other question that I, I'm more interested in, in like uh, working in the, how do we, how do we interact in, in this, in the live session, in the, in the performative aspect, then how do we kind of conclude or, or compact, uh, yeah, a product. And that for me would be more interesting to see what do we do in this, in this kind of, in here, not so much with the data that we have, even though the, the, that we also have talked about maybe doing kind of some kind of edition and having like, yeah, maybe a one, a 45 minute uh, video. But uh, yeah, that would be my answer. Any other ideas maybe from the, from the other participants? Maybe do you have some, Mariana, or? Myself? No, not really. I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's just no. Has, it's has, really. I think it's. I. I. What? That you do have one. No, I don't. Well, oh. I mean, I can't. I maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. I don't know. It's just. It's just. Uh, it's. It's really. I mean, it's. It's been. It's been great to listen to everyone, and it's. It's. I just I just thought that maybe we can we can we can actually do other dynamics maybe to 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 kind of experiment a little bit more with I mean one of the things that I'm very very fascinated at this point is that the the, the backgrounds of some people <laughs> change a lot and the others don't and kind of like this glimpse of uh, of of small context that on each of our in our lives um, I, I I'm just honestly I'm just talking the first thing that it's coming into my mind but I uh, I think it would be interesting to maybe submit a different uh, uh, yeah I don't know I have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we and the well, that's why we also wanted to invite you, you guys, to to the to the Slack. That it's really important that we that that we if you don't because always with a conversation is difficult sometimes to articulate ideas. But yeah. if you have like an idea, you can write it down, and and we for sure like definitely we try to engage with it and 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 try to write back and see because. At the end, that's true. The, the only one, th one thing we do want is what can we, the possibilities, the questions about, about the, po yeah, what, what's next. And, and, and if, until now, we have just been like, a me, me personally, I've been super amazed about the, just the possibilities of really like interacting with persons in, in Spain and in, in London or wherever, you know. And yeah. I'm super happy about that. So until now, I'm super like, still want to experiment a bit more. Until yeah. I until I kind of like decide something, yeah, that would be more. That would be my 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 approach until now. Yeah, that's the, that, that the power that you're seeing. Um, I'm. I mean, I, I see it too. Like it's 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 a it's a thing. It for me also. It feels sometimes wasteful when you see potential in something to not activate that potential, um, but. For, I, I think like I, I can follow some steps um, in also in Alberto's um, lead since for me um, the biggest product that is created out of this is a lot of motivation for us that so many people are taking part in it and it's just interesting um, how how our collective sometimes we have been 30 people um, now we are mostly four to six that come to these meetings um, is is divided in in, in so many different um, spectrums and here we just have like the space of people who are just really eager to get involved into stuff and they are interested and it's not a fight to keep them attracted or anything and that for me is like the one day in the week now for the last four weeks which is like kind of a little bit relaxing since um it's just like some people that also i don't have to keep you like entertain what I sometimes have like with people who are maybe should be inside of it and I want them to be with us and to help us and we need them because they do video or whatever but it's always hard to fight for people and here we just have like I think this this could be something like this this um, 
yeah, this place also where we can take energy out to bring it since we are all not physically connected, but we are somehow mentally connected in this, in the, in the, I think in the life goals that we have, since we are all uh, out of our intrinsical motivation are working on projects that, yeah, we, we don't have to. Yeah. And that's a, that's a super big power to work with people that just do stuff because they want to. And that's for me, if we now then can create something out of this to give it away somehow, like to give it to other people to make this more open source, I think, which we are already doing since we're making it accessible in a way, um, would be for me like a super great thing. But I think it's also really complicated. And this would be something that I would love to talk about with all the people who are interested in this project. Because we don't, we don't want to see ourselves as the ones people who are doing this project, and then we decide stuff. Um, this, this, this is a co-creative, open source, whatever process. Yeah, yeah. I had like a first exchange with Mariana like last week after the meeting about like how to prove, purify the content we produce, and the video which I was just showing. Um, Mariana sent it to me because she was kind of like inspired by it, how to create videos and how to like, um, I, don't, I don't know what exactly you had in mind with it, but I guess like the point of it was that um, you, I, I, I at least like liked that you had like this multi-dimensional view of like a certain topic and then that you could, because we're now like physical in one space, but um, in, in creating like, uh, a view in the forest that is displaying something that is not seen in the forest but somewhere else you kind of like create these relations that um, are unusual or like that are unusual for our like daily encounters so I, I do think it's interesting to work with video, the medium of video in a different way than we work now so that maybe we find a way that the the message like the or the, the, the definitions of terms or topics or things, opportunities we speak about, that they can also, that they also have like a, like a, that you can look at them in a split screen of like various spaces yeah. and translate them somehow into different spaces as well. So that there's also like kind of like an, another creative act of translation, not just from like this first step of like piling up the shit, but also purifying it in order to um, yeah, make this shit worth it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I also had this idea of like, maybe like building up a dictionary of like, because we, we had so many like, kind of like images of like last time we had like this, um, Pitan, Pitan, Pinata? Pinata, wasn't it? Yeah, Pinata. Um, yeah. We had like yeah, this but... image. And, and I think there's like, and I think there are like more, more moments like this, and I think they can be approached like in a really creative way. But obviously, this, this, I don't know if we can go to a creative process. Um, to, to, but yeah, the, there could be an opportunity or a possibility. Yeah. Depends on the time that people want to invest. Since I believe this, this is this is a very great um, knowledge production facility, also in a way. And if some people would uh, like to take some out of of this knowledge that it has been produced here, and then are so like I, I find this idea of purity that we're talking about really interesting, and maybe like now we are all more into it, and there comes this one idea of one of us who says, okay, maybe we can just try to explain this concept of purity related to our um, views of society. I don't know, a three minute video of video collage or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this could be like, um, I think this will grow somehow naturally. And I would love to have this educational content that uh, is being born out of these talks. But I think then, then we need an, an, ad, an addition to this talk, we need to have the work in the Slack since that is like where most of the the work is done in my opinion and it's like people sending each other files and interesting stuff to to let the vision grow and um so, so all the people who want to be involved in that just just come in the, in the digital temple channel and write your craziest idea there and then we will see if we can follow it 
yeah, I also think that the one one really interesting thing about the, the what we're, what what's happening here in the digital temple is not necessarily the the information, the conclusions that is happening mm -hmm. at the end, because I think at the end, like everyone's gonna get their conclusions anywhere, but it's like the like the cross referencing exactly and uh, how we are uh, dealing with topics in different layering and we're not stopping into like just sociopolitical or economical or spiritual you know so i think this kind of like how how knowledge is coming into play and how we bounce the the knowledge uh, back and forth and that for me is kind of like the process that needs to be uh, uh yeah transferred into uh, into something else because that's that's what i find interesting and i think that uh, uh, you know, like also with with the, the the idea that everyone is in a different kind of country and in a different place, in this kind of multi-layering knowledge kind of situation, it's really it's really amazing. And I think that's worth that. Just that's the, that's the part the part that I'm interested in, like researching, you know, and and maybe bringing it to to further development for other persons. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I guess, I mean, one of the things about Slack is that I can, I think it, I mean, I went through a very, very long conversation through some of the channels, but some of them are more kind of like things that I guess you guys talk, talk, yeah. or we can, we can do it like you this kind of like use the space to, uh, to make appointments and to, 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 I think. Uh, is that only her? And okay. some of the stuff are in. <laughs> but I mean, for now, for now, what we can do is just maybe uh, continue the conversation in Slack, and for the persons that are interested in maybe maybe saying something, and. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, oh what? Or what? <laughs> oh god! No, now it's gone. Shit! <laughs> I needed to. Uh, um, but that, yes, I know. It's like can be confusing. But maybe then we just do like the next meeting. Maybe we just meet for a meeting, which is not a digital temple, and just talk about what and how we can do it um, and prepare like a little bit of input because I think we have some ideas because it's it's a little bit um, a better also resonating with the society's idea that um, this could be a part of it that like all the people who are in here also somehow will be part could be part of the network and then we work on this content together and content could be content so I would say this is like a really a conceptual big topic and a project for itself and i would i would totally be in to work on that so if um, they are also interested um this could be like this the first co-creative step that we do yeah also for next week um to now we only have one person that is maybe presenting so um we could have more people for next week or we just like uh, use it for discussing a certain topic, like for example, how to um, work with like the, um, yeah, this idea of bringing this digital, purifying this digital temple and maybe a bit more like the concept and like reflecting on the previous temples. Yeah. But like if, if you guys know anybody who likes to present, um, I also will write to some more people but um, till now it's only this Marco from Pagamo who is having the street art book who maybe is going to present. Yeah, let, let, just if it's just one, it's also okay. I think we, we fill the time all uh, each, yeah. each, each time. But yeah, really big thank to all of you. Say, is it like rightly pronounced say? Or how do I pronounce hey. it? Say. Like, there's, nice. there's a H, but there's no H. Ah, say. Say. Yeah, beautiful. Like Shay. really, Shay. Shay. Yeah. Shay. Very good. Yeah. I really like the design of your of your um, plastic 
um, bottle um, sculpture okay. installation. Um, is there like any point where I can find the uh, better pictures also in the internet? Because I was looking for it and it was uh, hard to find. Do you have a link, maybe? Yeah, um, there there isn't really. There's not that many high quality photos on the internet at the moment. I'm doing up redoing my website, so hopefully it'll be up there soon. Okay. At the moment, it's just yeah. There's not really a solid place to find them. If do you want if you want one I can send you. Yeah, it would be nice to have them just also for the documentation of the digital temple yeah. uh, since it was part of a presentation and we also have this. I mean, we have the we have it in a video. Just wanted to be sure if there's like something that I couldn't find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and also and also this kind of situation is just. Uh, I always talk about the new the new normal, but you know, like I, I cannot I can never stop insisting on it because now this is like. We are going to be maybe the persons that are creating our own networks to work in the future, you know, the, for projects. Like, I don't think it's going to be so much like locally based, uh, you know, like you don't need to work with the persons you go to university to, you know. So we can find also in our conversation some kind of synergies between persons and in the future also develop projects between Mexico and, 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 and Hamburg if we're here or London. So I think it's also like nice to that we have this because of the possibilities that can open in the future, you know, and network wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks everybody for the very good cool. work. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ciao. Bye. See you next time. Bye. Bye, Tenuki. Ciao <laughs> the knock. Manolo, ciao. Hello, Manolo. Bye. 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 Bye, beautiful people. Ciao. I cannot. Ciao. I don't know why. <laughs> There's still this one person. I don't know who she is. <laughs> 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 okay, now we can talk. I <laughs> now, see you next week. Yeah, Bye. see you. Bye. Bye.